I call Ron Mark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, what more could be said about this bill? It's a, it's a very short bill, um, a couple of pages, but it certainly has generated some... Sorry? You think I can? Well, we'll give it a lash, shall we? Uh, it's a very short bill, and the intent of the bill is very clear, and for those that might have missed it, uh, going straight to the core, which really is at the guts of this, of what this bill does is pretty much contained in part two. Clause five, as has previously been said, validates the payment dates for the rates. Clause six, validates penalties added to those rates. Clause seven, declares all monies received by the council in payment of the rates and the penalties paid in respect of those rates to be and to always have been lawfully paid to and received by the council. And, and those are the interesting words to me, Mr Speaker to be and to always have been lawfully paid. Because they weren't, were they? They weren't lawfully paid. And that's really what the nub of this, you know, this bill is and why we've spent so much time in the House, why people went down to Christchurch, put a lot of time and effort into uh, drafting, hearing, taking submissions and moving this bill through three stages in the House. To... <laughs> To be and to always have been almost sounds a little bit Shakespearean, doesn't it? Lawfully paid. Lawfully paid. It would be nice if some of us could actually pop along to the supermarket and say, well, you know, the other week I came and I picked up some groceries and I'd just like you to consider that they have been and always had been paid for. <laughs> it's, it's a little bizarre, maybe a little Shakespearean. It's like amalgamation, something that boggles the mind as to how people could actually come up with these things but, or how people could make simple mistakes. I guess, and I do take on board some of the cautionary comments from my colleague on my right, William Seal, uh, is that it is tempting for someone like me who's come from a small council, um, Carterton, a council that certain people out there in the Hustings and some people in this house have advocated it's too small to run itself, couldn't possibly manage its assets, couldn't possibly comply with all the intricacies of the Act, and therefore on that and, and numerous other spurious arguments, needs and deserves and should be swapped, uh, swallowed up into and run by a larger council. Well, we've never done this. We've never made mistakes like this. Mastered and district councils never made this. And if people really want to get their heads around what's happening out in rural provincial with small councils and how well they are managed and how they don't end up in the situations where um, <laughs> money is sort of paid, uh, deemed to be and always have been lawfully paid, why they don't end up in those situations, you should really pull out the latest bill report and have a quick read. The bill report is really quite staggering and the revelations that some of the top performing councils in this country are some of the smaller ones, actually small rural provincial ones that have been run very well and don't require the time of this House to retrospectively pass legislation to correct their mistakes. I will acknowledge this. The current Mayor of Christchurch was not the Mayor of Christchurch when this happened. And the current CEO was not the CEO or was not one of the CEOs that was in charge of the Christchurch City Council at the time that these mistakes were made. Those, the credit for that lies with other people. But it is, I have to make the point. People who are elected into council, whether they be councillors, community board members or mayors or deputy mayors, at the time of their election and appointment, and for some of them, even a few years after that, do not actually come to grips totally 100% with all the procedural requirements that go with the job. That are particularly at the time of the annual planning consultation phase, particularly when you're taking submissions on an annual plan, setting rates, setting sewage rates, targeted rates, setting general uniform, uh, uniform rates, they are not 100% au fait with that procedure and it is up to the chief executive officer and his senior managers to guide and steer those councillors, the mayor, the deputy mayor, in the, process, in the procedures and the protocols that they must follow to comply completely 100% with the Act. It is up to, I'll say that again, the CEO, the chief financial officer, 
and the other entourage of senior managers who get paid hugely well, and particularly in Christchurch, I remember well the controversy over that particular CEO who gave himself a pay rise because he thought he was doing so jolly well. And here we are in the House, all parties of the House, putting all of their time into correcting something that the CEO of the Christchurch City Council should not have allowed to happen. And on top of that, Mr Speaker, I remember the, the, the visits by the Audit Office and how my council would ramp itself up and get ready for that visiting team of auditors. And we would have a preliminary interview with the Chief Auditor, the Mayor, the CEO, the Deputy Mayor, the Chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. We're talking about little Carterton here. We're not talking about New York. But we would do that. And we would get a clear picture from the auditor, the chief auditor of that team, which might comprise, and we're talking about a, a council with you know, eight, eight and a half thousand people, we'd have a team come in that might be three, four, even five strong. And they would outlay what it was that they were going to go through and what they would be looking for. Well, clearly the audit team that went through Christchurch for year after year after year after year did not check the procedures by which Christchurch was implementing its rates levy, its rates charges. It did not audit that. Now I know from talking to the audit office and we've had the hearing, we've had uh, hearings and we've had these discussions at the select committee that people are, uh, have got a different focus now. And people, I know that on a, a, at any one particular year, the audit will come in with a theme. The audit office will come in and they'll say, these are the things we're going to be looking at. But for this to have gone on year after year after year and been left undetected, and for us in 2015 to be sitting here in the house this evening, you know, past my bedtime, joking, <laughs> look, passing this legislation through the house is really not, it's just unbelievable, really. Really, particularly with a council that size that employs that many people and senior manager appointments and pay them what, 400,000, 300,000? And pay an audit office what? What was that last bill? Well, it certainly wasn't 90,000, which what Carterton pays. It was 200,000 in one year for the audit to be completed and still miss this. So here we sit. So, like many of the other parties in the House and the other speakers before me, New Zealand First has to put it on the record that it really struggles with retrospective legislation. We don't think that it's really ideal. And I think Paul Foster Bell's comments that, you know, so if the 20% of the legislation goes through this House, good homework there, Paul, um, is retrospective. We don't like it. We particularly don't like it when highly paid senior managers of a council aren't doing their job and aren't advising their mayor and their deputy mayor and their chair of the audit and risk committee and their councillors appropriately we end up in this situation. I would say that, um, what can I say to finish off? <laughs> I would say this. If this wouldn't it wouldn't have happened if I'd been mayor of Christchurch. And, uh, <laughs> And I would say that, uh, look, please, when, we are, when we're having this conversation and debate about bigger is better and bigger councillors get things right and small councils struggle, when we're having this argument, this debate about economies of scale and that, I'd like the House to remember this. The reason some small councils don't make mistakes like this is because the very small budgets that they have, for them, makes them very sensitive to expenditure and very sensitive to error particularly errors that cost money. And the rule of thumb we used in Carterton was this. For every $80,000 you spend, over and above what was budgeted last year, that will result in a 1% increase on your ratepayers. Can you honestly justify that 1% increase? But when you're dealing with big councils like Auckland Super City, $80,000 is postage money for one day. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make them blink. It doesn't make their eyes water. And therefore, they can, be, I guess, understandably, lose sight of the detail, lose sight of the pr protocols and procedures they should be following, and they can make mistakes. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. Cheers.